Good morning, everybody. How you guys doing? Pretty swell, pretty swell, right? Uh, last week, we we're supposed to start this new series called Answers, but about the whole world was sick, just about, it felt like. Uh, so you never know how people are going to react or how people are going to... Anyways, I don't want to dive in too much on that. But so we're starting it today, and we're skipping past that first message, which was a really good message, but uh, our, the main campus, Norco campus, has a very uh, great message on it if you want to go back on the YouTube. But today, uh, we're talking about proof of the resurrection. And this whole series is kind of based on uh, answering tough questions that we've all asked. And I said this earlier, and I want to say it again, is the reason we do this isn't so we could become uh, full of head knowledge, uh, geniuses, uh, philosophical, uh, savant, you know, it's, it's not for any of that. It's supposed to be for us to then in turn take this information, take this knowledge of God, take these proofs, and then use them to be able to preach the gospel to our friends, to our family, to our coworkers, to the people around us. Because the thing is, nobody wants to talk about something that they know nothing about. I don't want to find myself in that conversation. You know, some of us have probably lied about a few subjects in conversations. Like somebody asks us, have you seen uh, this new movie that came out? Have you seen the new, I don't know, uh, Star Wars? You're like, oh, yeah, I totally saw that. And you're like, I haven't. I don't know what's going on. I think we all kind of do share little white lies like that, right? Because truthfully, we don't want to look like we don't know what we're talking about. And so I want to start this message today on the proof of the resurrection by reading 1 Peter 3.15. So if you have uh, your Bible, if you have notes, uh, I always encourage those things. Because like I said, this message is for the Christian to be able to take out. And the worst thing that we could do is for this message to just take it, bury it, and do nothing with it. But it's 1 Peter 3.15. And it says this, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Would you guys pray with me for a moment? God, I pray that we would just be aware of your spirit. I pray we'd be aware of your words, God, and I pray that my words would be yours, Lord, because I know that uh, my word returns void, God, but your word never does, Lord. So I pray that my words would be your words, my thoughts would be your thoughts, God, and I pray that your spirit would be moving so that we would grow in the knowledge and understanding and the grace of you, Lord. In your name, amen. This past year, I think there's just, there's been a shortage just on about everything, right? A shortage on this morning. I went to Starbucks. I had to like call Mary like three different times to figure out uh, actually they're out of this. Uh, actually they're out of this. Actually they're out of this. And it's something that's common, right? And there was one time through the past couple of years I went to McDonald's and they're out of ketchup, and I was pretty upset about that. It's like you're McDonald's. How do you run out of ketchup? It's you sell burgers, fries, and then you make sure you have ketchup. Right? That's what goes on. And then my uh, Pastor Jim, my pops, uh, he went to Freddy's Burgers the other week, and believe it or not. They were out of French fries. You sell burgers and fries. You're supposed to have burgers and fries. And they're out of French fries, right? And then even Starbucks, it's like they have a huge menu, but there's like two drinks that you can order out of the whole thing because everything else is out. Everything else is gone, right? And I, I use this example. I kind of use this story because oftentimes as Christians, we could be like the McDonald's that doesn't have ketchup. Or we could be the Starbucks that maybe doesn't have the coffee. It's like, this is what you do, Starbucks. This is what you're supposed to sell. Freddy's Burgers, you're supposed to have French fries. Like, what do you mean you don't have French fries? You know, and I think sometimes as Christians, we, we walk around and we go to church and, and maybe we talk about Jesus sometimes, but when the rubber meets the road or when we want to share or people ask questions, we're like a McDonald's or a Starbucks without coffee, right? It's like, this is what you're supposed to do. This is what you're supposed to know. Jesus, this is who you're supposed to know. This is who you follow, right? Like, t talk to me about him. Why do you believe in him? Why do you believe that this happened? Why do you believe that he rose from the, the grave? Why did he come down for us? Why, why did we need him to come down for us, right? And so sometimes we could be Christians who are the McDonald's without ketchup. It's like, this is what you do. This is what you do. And so when we read this, uh, 1 Peter 3 15, it says, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. First and foremost, before we begin anything, we need to honor Christ the Lord as holy. It starts there. In our hearts, it starts with saying, Christ, you are holy. You are set apart. You are above us. 
And then from there, it says, from there, from that starting point, then we need to always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. You need to be prepared. You need to be uh, knowledgeable. You need to understand certain things. And I'm not saying you need to be uh, this all-knowing, just know the whole Bible front to back. If you can't memorize it, then you're not, then you don't get it. But all I'm saying to just, uh, we need to understand the simple uh, answers to simple questions, right? The simple things that all of us need to understand, like the proof of the resurrection. And again, like I said, it's not so we could beat people over the head or be the smartest person in the room because look, it says, yet do it with gentleness and respect. We need to be knowledgeable, ready with answers, pretty quick, but doing it with gentleness and with respect. Because as far as, uh, as what I can see when I read kind of like uh, articles or I look around, just even on social media, on anything, there's this idea, and sadly, some Christians hold this themselves, is that we need to have this blind faith, that this faith that we have is just completely blind. It's a shot in the dark. It's a fairy tale that we just, in our hearts, feel like it's right. In our hearts, feel like it's correct. But that idea of blind faith within context is talking about the future when Jesus returns for the things not seen. It's not talking about, oh, in Jesus, I have blind faith in Jesus, or I have blind faith that there is a creator of the universe. The Bible tells us that we look around at creation and it speaks the name of God, you know? The heavens declare God's glory. We look at that. And when we look at the resurrection, there's proofs to this thing. There's, there's history that backs it up, you know? There's, there's things that back it up outside of the Bible, which is beautiful. But when we do this and we come to this knowledge, like I said, we do it with gentleness and respect because like 1 Corinthians 3, or excuse me, 1 Corinthians 13 tells us that we, it, 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 with anything that we do, if we do not have love, then we're just a noisy gong, right? A clanging cymbal. We're just that guy in the movie theater who won't shut up. <laughs> I'm trying to watch your favorite movie. Uh, this is a side note, but I watched The Eternals, the Marvel movie when it came out last year at whatever point. And there was some like probably middle schoolers or high schoolers in there. And they're just like with their friends and with their girlfriends. They're just like <laughs> the whole time. And I turned around, I was like, hey, you guys got to be quiet, all right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's funny because like, that ninth grade, 10th grade is kind of teetering the line of where they don't respect like older people anymore, you know? But when you're at that age, you're like, oh no, like I need to be quiet because they boop, zip the lip. All I said was that. They never talked to, again the whole movie. It, but it was just too much. So I just had to say something. I wasn't mean. I just said, hey, buddy, you got to be quiet. That's it. But that's the person that we turn into, right, in the movie theater if we're just trying to bash people over the head or be the smartest person in the room or gain this knowledge so that we could say, look, look at me. So, so I could be puffed up. So I could be full of wisdom. So I could be uh, like Solomon who just had ultimate wisdom, right? That's not the people that we need to be. But instead, we need to be Christians who have answers with gentleness and respect. And so we're going to hop into that, the proofs of the resurrection. And I hope you use this in conversations. I hope you use this to solidify your faith more because faith, like I said, within context, if you think about it, the disciples, the apostles all wrote about things that they saw. They saw. Not that they heard of or some story that was told to them, but they wrote what they saw. And so when we think about that, even today within the court of law, one of the greatest things you can have is an eyewitness testimony. That's the hammer in the coffin, right? And so the apostles and the disciples are not people making up stories. They're true historical figures uh, who wrote down what they have seen and what they have heard. And so I want to start today with a little bit of church history because I think church history is, is important uh, for everybody's knowledge and just for everything going on. But Jesus, and just hear me out on this one, but Jesus is the most famous but by no means the only uh, person to claim to be the Messiah, specifically a Jewish person. So Jesus was uh, crucified in AD 33, right? That's what historians tell us. And so let's say right here, that's right here on the, on the timeline. This is a timeline, he's crucified right here. 10 years prior and 10 years after the fact, there's no shortage of three people who led revolts who claimed to be Jewish messiahs. And their names were, they'll be up on the screen right now, but their name was Judas, and it's not Judas how we know in the Bible, the one who betrayed Jesus, but there was Judas. Uh, he was from the province of Galilee as well, so it's like, okay. And he led a tax revolt uh, that crushed many Roman uh, rule, or much Roman rule, and there was also Anthronges. 
He also led a revolt. He also pushed back against the Roman government. He also claimed to be the Messiah. And there was Simon of Perea, who had been a slave to King Herod, and he rose up. And with all of these three people right here, I'm not going to go too deep into them, but with all of these, they all started a revolt claiming to be messiahs, claiming to be the saviors of their Jewish people to finally overthrow Roman rule. Because in that day, we know that even Jesus' followers were expecting him to like, hey, are you going to topple the government before you leave? Are you going to topple the government before you ascend? Like, what's going on here? So these people were fighting against the government, fighting against the emperors, fighting against Roman rule. And the thing with all of them is nobody knows their names, okay? You saw those. Nobody's ever heard of those. Nobody's ever seen those. Nobody's ever thought about them. They are nothing. Yet they started revolts claiming to be the Messiah, right? with force, with violence, with all of these things. And nobody even knows who their name is. But it's Jesus' name, it's Jesus' movement that had uh, no weaponry, that didn't start with violence, that had no plan to overthrow physically the government, right? Just the principalities of darkness, of the, gov- the evil governments of this earth. It, 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 Jesus didn't preach any of what they're talking about. It's the one that never picked up a weapon, That said, when you get slapped, you know, turn turn the other cheek. It said, forgive 70 times 7. It said, I'm not here to give to Jesus. As a matter of fact, they try to question him and said, what about taxes, Jesus? What do you say about this coin? What should we do with it? He says, you know what? Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. And so Jesus, completely opposite, without force, without violence, without setting fires to buildings, without uh, leading a group of people in riots, became the most famous, and his mission multiplied when he died. Multiplied by the thousands when he died. When they died, guess what happened? So did their movements. Overnight. Overnight. And so when we look at it, we're not using this to say, like, see, there's a bunch of people who claim to be messiahs. Yeah, but only one of them stuck out, and only one of their movements multiplied. And only one of their movements in all of human history, when, when, this, when Jesus died, it rapidly grew. And it was based on the idea that this Jesus Messiah died, but he rose again. He rose again. And so when we look at Jesus and when we look at history, we have to understand that. And in Acts chapter 5, there's, there's a high up priest. He, his name's Gamaliel. He, he addresses the Sanhedrin. And he actually tells them uh, something very important in this, because this is church history. Acts is one of the most historically backed books in the whole complete Bible. Uh, This is known to be true by atheistic scholars and theistic scholars. But uh, this movement is rapidly growing, right? This Jesus movement is rapidly growing. This, this Christianity rapidly growing. People walking in the spirit, healings, uh, miracles, all of these things. And this guy, this rabbi, Gamaliel, addresses the Jewish council, the Jewish leaders. And he says this in Acts 5. It's not going to be up there. I'm just going to paraphrase. But he says, look, if Jesus' movement isn't real, if he didn't rise from the grave... This will sputter out like all the rest. And now that we know through history, right, what he's talking about is all these other messiahs. He's, he, he's a person who's seen it. He's addressing the Jewish leaders of the day, and he's saying, if this isn't true, it'll sputter out like all the rest. It'll die like all the rest. This movement will mean nothing. But here's where it gets crazy. Here's where it's like, whoa. And this is somebody, he doesn't believe in Jesus. He doesn't believe Jesus rose from the grave. He just is kind of like there. He's trying to, just trying to piece together what's going on. Gamaliel says, but if it is of God, you won't be able to stop it anyway. And you might even find yourself opposing God. So we see, even in that day, if it was fake, it was phony, if it didn't work out, it's going to die like all the rest. It's going to die like all the rest, but instead, it rapidly expanded, rapidly multiplied. And so we got to ask people, we got to tell people these things and ask them why. Why do we think that happened? Why is it this one, the the one that transcends cultures, continents, uh, languages, uh, female, uh, transcends all of those things. Everybody comes and calls on the name of Jesus. Got to ask why. 
As we carry on, we're going to look at a few minimal facts, they call them, right? There's 12 minimal facts. I'm not going to go through all 12. That's ridiculous. It's going to, take, it's going to be like a six-hour lecture, and that's boring. Ain't nobody got time for that. Uh, <laughs> but there's a guy. Uh, he's the leading New Testament uh, scholar, atheist scholar. His name's Bart Ehrman. Okay, his name's Bart Ehrman. So if you're uh, into that stuff, you could look him up. But he's the leading New Testament scholar uh, who doesn't believe that Jesus rose from the grave, Right? So he's the guy, he's like the captain of the team, the captain who are saying, you know what, Jesus wasn't real. And these minimal facts that I'm going to talk about are things that people like him know to be true through historical study, through analyzing history. And these methods, these minimal facts, the methods that we're going to talk about today are the same methods that they use within history to figure out whether something is true or not. And the first one being, does that make sense, everybody? Yeah. But the first one being death by crucifixion. That's the first minimal fact. Uh, and we're not going to spend a lot of time by this, uh, on this one because this one, if somebody doesn't believe this, then they don't believe history. Okay, then they don't believe uh, what's going on with Roman history. They don't believe Greek history because this is one of, like, not attested at all. As a matter of fact, John Dominic Croissant, another non-Christian critical scholar of the New Testament, he states that he was crucified is as sure as anything historical can ever be. Okay, this is uh, in many different history, histories, writings. There's T Tacitus, there's Josephus, there's Lucian of Samosota, uh, and it's written in the Jewish Talmud. And there's all these things like it's, it's not a question. Okay, there was a person named Jesus. He came and he was crucified on a cross. Okay, and this, so that's a minimal fact number one. So now that we have that base, we can go into it a little bit more. But another minimal fact is the testimony of women. And this is, I don't know why, this is one of my favorite ones. This is one of my, uh, I don't know, I just really like it. I just really enjoy it. Because here's the thing, Jewish and Roman culture in that day, in that day, told us that, hey, a woman's voice, a woman's word, a woman's uh, testimony, it's invalid. It's questionable. It doesn't make sense. Like, it's something that can't be believed. It's something that you, you're not going to take and, and talk about something if you're trying to figure out eyewitness testimony, Okay. But the thing with God and how amazing God is, is from the beginning, right? We see that equal value within males and females. There's distinctions in both, but we see that God created them male and female in his image, okay? And so when we look at that, we see God, that's how God views males and females from the beginning. And so that culture of that day doesn't see that. They don't take the testimony of women seriously. But what's beautiful is in Luke 24, 11, it tells us, that women were actually the first people to say that they saw Jesus rise, to say that they saw Jesus uh, not, no longer dead, no longer in, in the tomb. And they're the first people, as a matter of fact, the disciples, the Greek word, it says they believed they were speaking nonsense. And that word nonsense in the Greek means feverish ramblings of delirium. Like even the disciples, when they hear these women telling them this, they're like, you sound crazy. Like you're telling me like a dude rose from the grave, like sure, he might have said this stuff, but even they can't believe it. And eventually, right, they see it. But women were the first witnesses and testifiers of the risen Jesus. And so with what historians call this is the principle of embarrassment. And he, let me explain it to you in, in kind of like simple terms. If I'm telling a story about myself or about uh, destiny or about whatever else is going on, I got the mic, I'm gonna embellish it a little bit, okay? That's just what it is. When we tell stories about ourselves, we're gonna make sure we, we puff ourselves up a little bit, right? Or if there was like, we had an embarrassing moment, we're gonna like kind of ixnay that from the story or what we were wearing that day. It was maybe like we're in pajamas all day, but we're telling everybody like, no, I got ready and I did this and I did that. Or the common one I know amongst uh, my friends is like, if we wake up late, we're like, no, we woke up early. Like, we, we didn't sleep until like 11. Like, that's not what happened, you know? We embellish stories. That's what people do, okay? And so this principle of embarrassment is the idea that you wouldn't write something embarrassing like that unless it were true, okay? So I'm not going to write, if I'm a disciple, if I'm an apostle, I'm not going to write that women were the first ones to say it because it's kind of embarrassing. Nobody's going to believe that, especially if I'm putting my faith in this Christ to rise from the grave. I'm not going to say that women were the first ones to tell me and then I wrote it down because that would be embarrassing in that culture. And you wouldn't write these things down unless it were true. 
And this principle of embarrassment is in all of history. It's not just in the Bible. It's in all of uh, Greek, Roman writings, Jewish writings of ancient pasts, okay? And here's the thing. Here's the logic. And here's where you kind of got to find a point of contention uh, in, your, in your mind. Is if I was somebody who was going to kickstart a, a movement based on a lie... If I decided, you know, I'm going to come up with a scam that this Jesus guy, he rose from the grave. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to get a group of people in the same room in a culture that doesn't respect women's testimony. And, and I'm going to get us all to get together there. And I'm going to say, here's how we're going to start it with a woman's testimony. That doesn't make, logically speaking, any sense in that day. Zero sense in that day. So the reason they wrote it this way is because it, were, it was true. This is how it went down. If you wanted to kickstart an entire fake movement in that day, you wouldn't start that way. That's not how you would get it cracking. So as we move on, we think about that, and we think how amazing and beautiful it is that God used the words of a woman to, to be able to testify about him alone is fantastic. One thing I always, this is a sidebar, but one thing I like to tell people is why not follow Jesus just for the sole fact of how he viewed women, of how, women, of how countercultural he was for women, and how he advocated for women in his day, and even all throughout Scripture. If, if anything, like, just read about those things. Read how he changed culture in that regard. But anyways, we move on to minimal, the second minimal fact we're going to talk about, or excuse me, the third one. Uh, it's the disciples believe Jesus rose and appear to them. And so the best way I can explain this is uh, scholars understand that the disciples and the apostles were real people. They existed. They're actual historical figures. And here's the thing. The disciples truly believed that Jesus rose and appeared to them. And it's like, well, we already know that. But through history, through critical thinking, through digging up writings and stuff, people today can say that these people truly, truly believe they saw something that uh, changed their lives forever. But what people would say today, or maybe people have said to, to kind of talk about it in a way that makes more sense to them, is that, well, they were kind of all under some spell, or they were kind of all under some delirium, or maybe they're doing uh, some weird hallucinogen drugs, all of them, right? <laughs> like, because you can't explain away through historical findings and writings, you can't explain away uh, that the disciples actually never believed in Jesus, that he rose from the grave. You can't. It's impossible. It's, a, it's uh, just impossible. And so, like I said, they use other explanations to explain that away. Because here's the logic with this one, is that the disciples were cowards when Jesus died. <laughs> like their leader, Christ, he was killed. Peter, one of the best apostles that, that was there, he denied Jesus three times, okay? In historical writings, three times. People that were ride or die for Jesus who were by his side, once Jesus was taken in, they scattered. They ran. As a matter of fact, it says they closed themselves and locked the doors, right? They went inside and they hid, and they were terrified. They were cowards <laughs> in that moment, these historical findings are true. And so the thing that we have to ask is what happened in the span of two, three days from Friday to Sunday that uh, the disciples, the apostles, these true historical figures were terrified, locked away, cowards, scattered to all of a sudden boldly proclaiming the name of Christ. Boldly proclaiming in the face of imprisonment, in the face of torture, in the face of death, in the face of persecution, all of a sudden changed. All of a sudden, they're terrified to now they're boldly proclaiming Christ. They're denying Christ to saying he's the way, the truth, and the life, all in a matter of three days. You have to ask them, what changed them? You have to ask, what did they see? You have to ask, what, what could truly change somebody to flip on a, the switch that quick? And I know, I know in my life, and I'm sure in your lives, there's been moments that are either detrimental or something crazy happens or something that you can't even explain and it changes you in an instant. Whether you had a low moment or an extremely high moment, something crazy happened to where it changed your thinking forever. And oftentimes, probably 100% of the time, nobody changes their view on something overnight unless they see something miraculous. Unless they see something that only... Uh, that they couldn't even explain themselves other than Jesus rose from the dead. 
And so we know that. We know that about the disciples. And this is history. This is all things, like I said, that is accepted. They truly believed that they saw Jesus and that he appeared to them after his death. And so we carry on with this same idea, and we're going to talk about Paul. Paul, a persecutor of the church, was also suddenly changed. And uh, atheists, agnostic scholars all know Paul to be a true person. And we all know Paul. I love that train, dude. (laughs) But they know Paul to be somebody who hated Christians to the point of murdering them, imprisoning them, uh, just trying to find wherever they were meeting, trying to find wherever they're do, whatever they are doing to make sure that he silenced this idea that Jesus Christ is Lord. And they profess and scholars know that he was a Christian hater, okay? He hated them. And so the question that we have to ask this true historical figure, again, is what changed him on a dime, What changed him to be somebody who hated them, who pointed the finger at them, who murdered them, who imprisoned them, to all of a sudden becoming one of them? And so you have to ask people these questions. You have to ask people these things because, look, here it is. We all just got done with New Year's Eve. We all got done with Thanksgiving, Christmas, whatever it is. We all got family members that were kind of like, bro, you're kind of annoying, like... I don't really want to be around you right now, you know? And, and we're frustrated with people or with friends, and it's like, well, they hurt me like 10 years ago, so I can't even look at them right now, you know? And, and we act this way as human beings. And that's how we act with relationships in our life. And you're telling me that somebody who hated them to the point of murdering them, all of a sudden, like, oh, no, actually, I'm really cool with them, you know? There's some people we hate from 20 years ago. <laughs> There's some people humans hate from five years ago, from three years ago who won't even sit at the same table with them. But then Paul, all of a sudden, going from a way more uh, larger hate of Christians than we could ever have probably for anybody, to joining them, to being one of them. And you have these Christians who he's killed their cousins, he's killed their friends, he's killed their uh, just family members, everything, and they're welcoming him with open arms? It says the disciples even, the apostles, they were afraid of Paul when he first came around because they're like, we know that guy. We know what he's done. So we got to ask the question of how did this happen? How can you explain that? How can you explain that? Because Paul is probably one of the greatest examples of what everybody goes through, okay? First denial, like, I can't follow Jesus. I don't want to. I can't. Maybe I don't hate him, but it's just like, you know what? I don't want to. But then Paul goes from that that moment to having a miraculous uh, sighting and a miraculous moment with the risen Christ to the point that he changes. To the point that he changes. And Paul is somebody, he's a genius, who ends up writing most of the New Testament, all because he had a moment with Christ. All because he had a moment with Christ. That's all of us. Clay, you could come up. Uh, That's each and every one of us. That's our friends. That's our family. That's people that we want to see come to Christ. There's just people who deny, who don't want to hear it, who don't want to understand it, who have a miraculous moment with Jesus. Some of us didn't want to hear it, didn't want to understand it. I grew up in the in the church, right? I grew up in it, but it wasn't about till I was like 22, 23, where I realized, okay, there's something real here. There's something, there's something uh, miraculous here, and I had a moment with God, and all of us have had those moments with God, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping that when we go through this series, that when we talk about it, because this is the thing, I'll be, I'll, I'll be straightforward with you guys. We're, tr- we're like trying to get the balls, uh, the wheels going on this, right? We're trying to get the wheels popping. We're trying to get this, this ship moving. And it's not going to happen unless we become knowledgeable. It's not going to happen unless we share the gospel. It's not going to happen unless the people in this room do something. Just straightforward. It's just not going to happen, okay? I'm going to speak plainly with you because it's just us in here. Like it's, it's not anybody new. It's not anybody uh, who I'm going to offend. I hope not. But it's these things that we need to understand. It's these things that we need to be confident in. It's our faith that we need to stand securely in, not a faith. We don't believe in fairy tales. Like, we don't believe in something that we can't grasp. We we believe in history. We believe in Christ. We believe he rose from the grave and died for our sins and atoned for our sin and turned away the wrath of God. 
turned away the justice of God that all of us deserve so that way we could walk holy and blameless and upright in his sight. So the reason that we do these, it's like, I want you, one, to know what to say in these moments, but two, I want you to, like, invite people. We're going to talk about, like, next week, we're going to talk about why doesn't God do anything about evil? I know a lot of people personally are like, that's the one that they can't just grasp in their heads. They don't want to believe that one. They don't want to talk about that one, right? Because here's the thing. There's a great C.S. Lewis quote. C.S. Lewis said that people should not say this next quote right here, okay? He said, this is what we can do. This is what we can't do. We can't say that I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. A man who is merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. <laughs> he would either be a lunatic or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. And it continues on and it says this. I'm waiting. There we go. It says either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or he can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about this, about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. The thing with Jesus is somebody who claims to be God is either a lunatic or the truth, okay? Plain and simple, there's no in between. And God, and Jesus didn't leave that up to us leave that up to just decide, you know, uh, he's either God or just a human or just a really great moral teacher. Like you could believe in him if you want or in his teachings, but not as Lord. It's either he's Lord or he's not. Okay. And in our lives as Christians, we need to live that way too. I don't think a lot of us live like Jesus is Lord. I think a lot of us live like Jesus is the guy that we kind of talk about on Sunday. Jesus didn't leave that up to, for our decision, for our choice, right? He didn't leave that up to us to decide for him. He came and boldly acted out with his death on the cross, defeated death, so he could say, I'm God. So he could say, I am Lord. So he could say that God from the Old Testament and the creation, it's John 1, 1, right? Everything was created through Jesus. Outside of him, nothing came to be. He is Lord. He is God either deny it or we can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God, right? And so with that, I just want us to take these things into consideration, take these things uh, into our minds and really sit on them and really understand them and begin to be confident in sharing the gospel with people, begin to be confident in like maybe thinking, here's my thing, I'm just going to be honest with you because I want to be honest with you guys, is I have too many Christian friends. I'm just going to be honest. I work at a church. I'm only around Christian people, you know? And I'm slowly, just within the past month, trying to uh, work outside of this, like be, uh, I go to the coffee shop, the Starbucks that's by my apartment consistently now, and I'm talking to people, I'm talking to people, and I'm doing these things. I'm realizing that I have to step out of my comfort zone because here's the thing, I can't ask you guys to do anything that I'm not doing. It's just the truth. It's just the truth. And Klaesov behind me right here, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about him for a second. But at, at, our, at our Bible study, he was telling us that it's like he, he worked up the courage to share with somebody. And he said in his mind, he was just like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing, you know? He thought he was freaking out on the inside. And his brother was there, too. And his brother was like, dude, he sounded completely fine. <laughs> like, like, it's totally fine, you know? But it's like, it's moments like that. And those are the things that we need to talk about because I think a lot of us are afraid. A lot of us, it is scary. A lot of us are like, well, I don't want to be met with this or I don't want to be met with that. And like I said, it's either Jesus is Lord or he's not. He's Lord or he's not. So I share that just to encourage everybody to know that is gonna, it is going to be scary. It is going to be a little like, a little tense sometimes. But guess what? First Peter 3.15, back to the top. Always be ready with the reason for the hope that is in you, but look, yet do it with gentleness and respect. You're not there to argue with people. You're not there to, like, convince them. You're there to preach the gospel so then the Holy Spirit can do its work. So then the Spirit of God can do its work. You're not going to save anybody. Your words aren't going to save anybody, but the Holy Spirit through you is what's going to bring people to Christ. It says that God draws people to him, right? 
God does that. And then once they're in his hand, nobody can snatch them out. And our job is to help people, usher people along to the calling that God has in their life when he's drawing them closer and closer to him and closer to him. And we could plant and we could water and we could do these things and we could talk with people and we could meet with them, but it's God who causes the growth. It's God who causes the heart change. It's God who causes uh, people to, to, to fall at his feet and worship. But we must do it with confidence. And understand, like I said, our faith, proof of the resurrection, is one of the most historically backed things in all of the like history. And I don't think some of us realize that. Like I'm not walking on thin air here, you know? I'm just believing in what I know to be true. That's the original definition definition of faith, is the disciples had faith in what they knew to be true, had faith in what they saw, had faith in what they understood. In the same way, I'm somebody, and I hope we are all people who have faith in what we know to be true. We have faith in things that have been seen, and faith in the words of these disciples, of these apostles, and of the people who went before us. Make sense? So like I said, we're not going anywhere unless we finally step out of our comfort zones, plain and simple. Plain and simple. So we either fall at the Lord's feet, or we say, you know what? I'm okay. And that's your decision. Let's pray.